Did you know that up to 90% of UK-based companies will suffer some form of security breach within the next 12 months? And that's a worrying statistic. Perhaps more disturbing is the fact that security breaches are rising. This is due to attackers exploiting the pandemic and our global shift to working remotely. What is clear and of growing concern is that our biggest risk to cybersecurity is unfortunately our end users. Now, this could be for several reasons. Maybe it's human error, a weak password or credentials used across multiple online services, for example. Maybe they've been a target of a phishing campaign and unknowingly signed into a scammer's website. Or maybe they just don't see your company's security posture as being their concern. Even now, you could be sitting there watching this video thinking, well, it hasn't happened to us or it's nothing to do with me. But here's the thing. How do you know? How confident can you really be? You see, just because you haven't detected it doesn't mean it never happened. In today's video, we're going to investigate identity services and understand the measures that we can take to secure company assets and in turn protect intellectual property. You see, in simple terms, an identity is just an object that can be authenticated. This could be your user account, your computer account, a service account, or even a group. Let's take a quick history lesson to ground our knowledge and understand how things have evolved. Now, way back in the mid 90s, the most widely used operating systems were either Windows NT4 or Windows 95. We didn't have smart devices. We typically worked at our desk and authentication, but that was standalone and local to the machine. This obviously raised some issues. Let's say we had 20 desktops in the office and needed to access resources on each. This would mean that we would either need to have an account on every machine or know the local administrator credentials, neither of which built good security posture. As a response, Microsoft introduced a new centralized identity provider, which was named Active Directory and introduced with the arrival of the Windows 2000 set of operating systems. This meant that instead of knowing the local username and password for each machine, the central authority or the main controller, as it's more commonly known, would grant or deny access to the authenticating user and then issue a security token so that they could access resources. This meant that the username and password were stored once. It also meant that updates, permission assignments, and access control were all administered from a single place. And make no mistake, Active Directory is still widely consumed today. In fact, over 95% of the Fortune 500 companies have it deployed on their local network. But the world has moved on. And over the past 20 years, we have seen a cultural shift in how we work, collaborate, and consume information. In today's world, we want to use mobile devices. We want to consume software as a service and social-based applications. We want new ways to protect our identities, and this all requires new tooling to enable us to do so. Azure Active Directory is Microsoft's cloud-based identity and access management service. It simplifies the way that organizations manage authorization and access control by providing single identity systems for both their cloud and on-premise applications. You can use it as a standalone service or integrate it with on-premises Active Directory. You can even federate it to other security graphs such as those used by Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter. From a security point of view, Azure AD comes into its own. Administrators can control access to corporate apps based on conditional access policies. They can require users to register for multi-factor authentication and work with developers to provide single sign-on through pre-existing credentials. Now, Currently, there are multiple pricing tiers and different ways to purchase the service. But for the sake of simplicity, we'll focus on just free. These are the free tier, premium P1 and premium P2. The free tier is created when you sign up to an Azure or Office 365 subscription. And it's worth noting, this is shared between the two. Whatever I create in one account is then visualized in the other and vice versa. Azure AD Free allows you to administer users and create groups. It will allow you to synchronize with your on-premises environment and configure self-service password reset policies for up to 5,000 cloud-native objects. 
The Premium P1 Edition then takes this further, supporting advanced administration such as dynamic groups, conditional access, self-service group management, identity manager, and cloud write-back capability. With Premium P2, Microsoft then adds several services such as identity protection, risk-based conditional access, entitlement management, access reviews, and privileged identity management. But enough talking. Let's jump into a quick demo and take a look at the services. So from the portal, I will select my directory and then work down the list, highlighting some of the more important options. I'll start in the overview section. As you can see from here, I can determine the license that I'm using, which in this case is Azure AD Premium P2. I can also make note of the domain, azuredan.net, and I can also quickly see any authentications that have occurred from the sign-in graph. If I select users from the left-hand menu, I'm presented with a list of user accounts that have been added. Now notice from the top menu, I can add a new user, send an invitation to a guest account hosted in a remote directory, and perform bulk operations such as create, delete, invite, and download. I'm also able to launch the multi-factor authentication portal. This would allow me to configure which users will require additional security controls when authenticating to the directory. Now pay attention to both user type and directory synced columns. This indicates whether the account is native or from a guest directory, and whether the account is synchronized with an on-premises domain controller. Remember, in a hybrid environment, you'll be consuming resources from both in the cloud and on-premises. So a consistent synchronization between them will enable seamless traversal of resources. Let's go ahead and add a new user to the directory. As you can see, I'm presented with two options, the ability to create a new user in the Azure Dan.net organization or invite a guest user from a remote directory. I'll stick with Azure Dan and enter the identity information that will be used to sign in. I'll also set the initial password that will be used on first authentication. Now notice that I have the option to add the identity to both groups and directory roles. For now, I will leave the group assignment blank. The reason for doing so will become clear later. As you can see, by default, we're a member of the user's role. This is the base level role in Azure AD. But if I click the link, I can configure different directory roles for my identity each of which are a collection of permissions that will allow me to perform specific administrative functions within my tenant. Now, it's important to remember that role-based access control, or RBAC as it's more commonly referred to, can also be configured at the resource level. So you're typically going to find a combination of the two as you navigate through your resources. And this can be quite tricky to get your head around. So we'll come back and revisit this in a later video session. Now notice that I can also boost security by selecting to block signing requests from anywhere other than the location that I specify on account. Remember, when it comes to security, less is more. Don't give anyone or anything more access than they need because it will only serve to weaken your security posture. Next, we'll look at job information. And you may think it's irrelevant and choose to overlook it, especially if you're synchronizing with hybrid identity servers on premises or have perhaps integrated with applications such as Workday. But for our standalone demo, I want to enter the information as this is going to yield some automation to our Azure AD group population. I'll set the title to Senior Cloud Architect, the department to one commercial partner, the company to Microsoft, and add Russell as the user account manager. So our identity has been added to the directory. We're now ready to authenticate. But before we do, let's take a moment to investigate some other settings. From user settings on the left-hand menu, notice that I can choose whether accounts can access the administration portal. I can also specify if they can register applications into the directory and determine whether or not to allow social media platforms such as LinkedIn to be affiliated with directory accounts. Now pay attention, by enabling this cross-graph integration, what we can do is help build rich insights into user object profiles and thus enable better collaboration between teams. Also notice that I can pull rich telemetry from the activity section. From here, I can review sign-in information, I can query account changes and investigate bulk operations. 
Now, historically, to simplify resource assignment, administrators have created groups. This is nothing new. If you've been on any corporate network, then chances are you've been a member of a group. Groups are used to simplify security assignments, simplify communication, and control access to resources. In Azure Active Directory, this principle continues, offering two group types, security and Microsoft 365. Security groups are used to give group members access to applications, resources, and assign licenses. Members can be users, devices, service principles, or other groups. Microsoft 365, in contrast, are used for collaboration. This group type gives members access to a shared mailbox, calendar, file, SharePoint sites, and so on. Now, notice the membership type column, or more specifically, how identities can be manually assigned or dynamically added by meeting membership expressions. Think back to the account I just created. I left the group membership blank, but highlighted the importance of completing the job information section on the profile. This is because I wanted to take advantage of dynamic group membership administration. Let's take a closer look. If I open the Microsoft One Commercial Partner Security Group, I can investigate the logic expression that will be used to grant or deny group memberships. As you can see, if I select Dynamic Membership Rules, accounts are added if the department attribute is set to One Commercial Partner and the company name is set to Microsoft. Because of this, if I select Members, I'll see the account that we previously created. Groups can also be assigned group owners. These can either be users or service principals. As an owner, you can manage group membership and group settings, even if you're not a member yourself. In the license section, we specify the licenses that we wish to configure for groups. For instance, if I select one of the Microsoft 365 license types, you'll see that members gain access to popular applications as well as protection from services such as Cloud App Security, Rights Management, and Microsoft Defender. Now, as an Azure AD administrator, one of the first things that you're going to want to do is align your company domain name to your tenant. You see, when our tenant is created, it's assigned an on Microsoft.com domain name, which, to be honest, doesn't really translate to our public identity. Thankfully, adding a custom domain name is a relatively simple process. We select Add Custom Domain and then specify either an MX or TX record that we're query in our DNS service to prove ownership. We'll also want to add our own authentication experience for end users, and this can be achieved by adding company branding. We can add custom background, banners, icons, and text that are set expectations for authentication. As you can see from my example, I've added a custom background and displayed my company authentication policy. So at this point, our directory is looking pretty good. We've added an identity, configured group assignment, and set up our authentication experience. What we now want to do is ensure that the right identities are authenticated and in turn protect our company assets. Fortunately, this again is a relatively simple process with things like Azure AD conditional access. Now, in its simplest form, conditional access policies are if-then statements. If a user wants to access a resource, then they must complete an action. For example, perhaps a payroll manager wants to access a finance application. Now, because of the sensitivity of the resource, we could configure a policy to ensure that multi-factor authentication is required and that they access the application from a company-managed device. Let's take a look at this in practice. As you can see, I have a conditional access policy in place, which is applied to all users of AzureDan.net and for all applications consumed. If I select conditions, I will say that access will be granted only after user risk and sign-in risks have been evaluated. User risk is the probability that the given identity has been compromised. This includes things like leaked credentials and any unusual activities that may be flagged. Signing risk, in contrast, considers aspects such as atypical travel, malware-linked IP addresses, or unfamiliar signing properties. Finally, I will specify the locations that I consider to be safe. With all conditions met, I will state that multi-factor services must be used when authenticated. So before we test, we want to configure one last thing, and that's the software as a service applications that we wish to make available to end users. To do so, I will click on Enterprise Applications from the left-hand menu. 
Now, what this allows me to do is connect to thousands of pre-integrated business applications. I can set properties, manage user access, and configure single sign-on that will reduce repeated authentications. Adding an app is simple. We click on New Application, and then from the gallery, search for the app that we wish to include. If it's an app being developed in-house, we can also complete the registration from here, specifying the conditions of authentication. In this example, let's go ahead and add LinkedIn. Now, once the account is created, I'm prompted to assign users and groups. For our example, I'll add all users. Next, I'll select my single sign-on method. Now, notice that I can select several authentication methods here. For our instance, I'm going to select password base. This will enable password storage and replay through an extension or mobile app. Finally, I can set conditional access policies to the application by specifying things like the location of the user, the enrollment status of the device, and whether authentication is protected with services such as MFA. Perfect. So now we're able to authenticate with our new account and see what the sign-in experience looks like. I'll go ahead and navigate to myapps.microsoft.com. Now, the first thing that we should notice is the authentication experience. Notice the customized background and the text that's being displayed. This is because we configured the customization earlier in the demo. Because this is a new account and the first time authentication has occurred, we'll also need to change the temporary password and set up multi-factor authentication. I'll do this by choosing to have an authentication text message sent to my mobile. We'll also have to set up more verification controls. This is because we've elected to empower the Azure DAN employees the ability to be able to perform self-service password resets. In this case, I will need to verify my phone and set up a recovery email account. Now, once complete, we are granted access to our software as a service based applications and can take advantage of our directory single sign-on capability. Again, these applications have been configured in the Enterprise Applications Portal through Azure AD. If we want to add more or perhaps configure conditional access restrictions for some of the more sensitive apps, I simply need to head back into the Administrative Portal and configure as necessary. If I view my account from a user perspective, I can modify my multi-factor authentication preferences, perform self-service password resets, and manage my registered devices. I can also review my recent signing activity and report anything suspicious back to admin. To be honest, this would have probably been picked up automatically through threat analytics, but ultimately what we want to do here is empower our users to report anything suspicious and therefore make them more conscious of our security posture. Wow, we did cover a lot today, and I hope that this session has been informative. Rest assured, we have much more to cover when it comes to identity management, so we will revisit these topics. At this point, however, my goal is to introduce the concepts and ensure that you're comfortable navigating the services. Remember, this is a marathon, not a sprint. In our next session, we will begin to look at the security consoles in both Azure and Microsoft 365. We're going to focus on understanding our security score and the mechanisms that we can employ to ensure that they're improved and remain high. And remember, these sessions are driven by you. While I have a helicopter view of the things that I want to cover, I'm always open to suggestions and requests for content. Thank you.